Welcome to another episode of the Mapscaping Podcast. My name is Daniel and this is a podcast for the geospatial community. So today's episode is a little different. There's no amazing guest in the studio with me today. It's just me. And today I want to try and shine light on side hustles for people like us, small businesses that people like us can start. All too often I feel like the geospatial industry is focused on the short head, the military applications of geospatial, the insurance use cases of geospatial the business to business use cases of geospatial. And when we talk about these use cases, we, we use words like solving problems and making better decisions, creating value. And sometimes, at least for me, it feels like that value creation in the geospatial industry is something that big businesses do for other big businesses. So in this episode, I really want to focus on your business ideas, the side hustles that you have created, or the opportunities that you see. In order to do that, I've crowdsourced a few ideas from Twitter, and I've added a few of my own ideas. So bear in mind, I'm using the word ideas. So these are not recipes for success. There is no guarantee. They are ideas. That's it. But the great thing about ideas is that they are free. And you can give them all away and still have more than enough for yourself. So I'm not trying to find the right idea for you. I am merely saying here is a collection of ideas. Some of them are working. Some of them have yet to be proven. You can pick and choose. You can look at all of them and say, these are not for me. None of these are any good. That's okay. Maybe we need to see a bunch of bad ideas before we can recognize a good idea. So I want to start off by talking about a, a post on Twitter that I made a wee while ago. And the post was, was this. Who's got a map-related side hustle? Who is building something on the side related to geospatial? It would be great to see what you're up to. And it was really great to see what people were up to. Have, have a look at some of these things here. So someone writes in and says, I got a little obsessed with the around the world in 80 days and discovered that there wasn't a nice detailed data set charting the route described in the book. So I made one. Hashtag R stats. And like, this might sound like a kind of ridiculous side hustle, but I want to introduce you to something called GeoGuessr. So if you go to GeoGuessr, and that's spelled G-E-O-G-U-E-S-S-R dot com, today you'll see this like built out site. I mean... It's kind of amazing. There's a Twitter following of about 20,000. It's got its own subreddit with, I think, 40,000 people in it. There's a Discord server, a Facebook group, Instagram pages. You can buy, there's a, a GeoGuessr store. There's streams. I, I guess this is something to do with Twitch. There's gift cards. It's available in different languages. It's on the App Store as an app, and you can download it for Android via Google Play. It is humongous. And so what is GeoGuessr? Well, GeoGuessr started off... I don't know what it is today because I can't log in. I need to sign in and, and hand over my firstborn to, to play the game. And it is a game. But last time I checked, it was a really, really, really simple Google Maps application where it showed you a random picture of Street View and Google Maps and you got to guess where you were. And you could click on a map to sort of say where you were. And then it would show you the distance from the location of the image, the location of that Google Street View image, and where you guessed it was taken. And, and that was it. And now it's this business. If you search for the Wayback Machine, you end up on a website called web.archive.org. And this is pretty amazing. This, this website, the Wayback Machine, takes a snapshot of the internet from time to time. And it saves those snapshots. And you can go back. So you can paste in a URL and see what that website looked like, you know, when these snapshots were taken. So if I go to, if I use this, if I paste in the URL of GeoGuessr, I can see that the first snapshot of this was taken in 2013, I believe. And to be honest, the website kind of sucks. So there's a big Google Street View image on the website. There's this little sort of box on the right-hand corner that says, click the map to place your guess. And yeah, that's it. That's all it was. A Google Street View image where it says, look at the area and figure out where you are. Click anywhere to start playing with a box on the right-hand side that says click on the map to guess where that, this image was taken. That's it. And today, it looks like a thriving business. Okay, so I can only guess how much this website makes. But if I go to a website called ubersuggest.com, I type in the URL of this website, it'll sort of make some estimations about the, the amount of traffic. And, and just to add context, when I use the same website and ask it to estimate the amount of traffic that Mapscaping got Dot com gets every month it constantly estimates the traffic at below quarter of the actual traffic so there's a significant difference between the estimated traffic and the actual traffic 
and it's always a significant underestimation of the actual traffic. Okay, back to geoguesser.com. According to this, the organic monthly traffic is 370,000 visits a month. And remember, this website significantly underestimates the, the traffic volume. Well, that's kind of amazing. Again, we, we don't know how much this website is making, but my guess is that if you can afford to build a dedicated app for Android and iOS, my, my, my guess is that there's some kind of money changing hands there. The commerce is happening and this website is successful. Again, think about the web archive snapshot of this website when it first showed up in 2013. It was pretty simple. And to be honest, it kind of sucked. Look at it now. All this to say that when someone shows up and says, hey, I've become a set obsessed with the Around the World in 80 Days book, and I've discovered that there isn't a nice detailed data set charting the route described in the book, I made one. It, we have no idea what this is going to turn into. Okay, so a few other interesting things that showed up in this thread that people are building. Um, it, it seemed to me there was plenty of web shops out there. A couple of them that stood out were web shops selling, I, I guess it's print-on-demand clothing, so or almost merchandise stuff, sportswear, towels, t-shirts, pillowcases, that kind of thing, based on satellite imagery. Dan Ford created a map projections for babies book. I think he even ran a successful Kickstarter to get, to get that going. Here's someone who's starting a newsletter focused on agriculture and earth observation. Personally, I think a newsletter business is an absolutely brilliant idea. I saw a newsletter the other day called Payload, so payloadspace.com if you want to check it out. And listen to this. How specific is this? We write a daily newsletter covering the business and policy of space. So I'm looking at the Twitter profile right now, and this is in September 14, 2021. Here's the pinned tweet. We are happy to announce that we have raised 650000 in seed funding. 650000 in seed funding from a list of email addresses. That's pretty amazing. And I think the really amazing thing about email is that, that the scalability of it, right? So it doesn't matter if you're writing an email for one person or 15 people or 25 people or 100 million people, the cost of writing that email is exactly the same. I mean, sure, depending on the email platform you're using, when you get to 100 million, there'll be just some different costs involved, but I'm, a think, but I'm assuming that if you have 100 million subscribers to your email, then it's probably not going to be a problem. And this makes me think, like, where are the email newsletters for the geospatial industry? So we just had that example there of someone starting an email newsletter specifically for Earth Observation and Agriculture, Wow, like imagine how many other industries you could start that newsletter for. Imagine how much money is involved in earth observation and insurance. Where is the newsletter for geospatial Python enthusiasts? Keeping people up to date with all of the stuff that's happening in Python, the new libraries that are coming out, the new tools that are being made, the different platforms and applications. So it's pretty cheap to start an email newsletter. If you go to getreview.co, you can start an email newsletter for free. You can do the same thing at MailChimp. I think it's free for the first 1,000, maybe 2,000 subscribers. I'm pretty sure the platform that I use, ConvertKit, has the same deal. For the first 1,000 subscribers, it's free. And you might be thinking, well, how will I make money with an email newsletter? Well, I guess most of them make money through advertising. But if you had your own product to sell, why wouldn't you do that through your email newsletter? Or why couldn't you do affiliate marketing through an email newsletter? Anyway, I thought this was a brilliant idea. An email newsletter that focuses on agriculture and earth observation if anybody out there is listening to this and, and thinks email newsletters are the way to go like i do and want to and wants to make one wants to start an email newsletter business please get a hold of me i'd love to hear from you so here's something slightly different this person says my side hustle is designing maps for other people's board games so what do all these projects have in common well all of them are made by people like us people that are trying new things people that are sharing their work people that are not waiting for permission my guess is none of these people have a business degree in creating online applications or deeply understood their economics behind creating a, a map projections book for babies. I also think it's highly unlikely that any of them went to school for to learn how to create maps for board games. I'm imagining all of these people just saw an opportunity and took it or wanted to try something. And instead of waiting for somebody to tap them on the shoulder and say, yes, it's okay, you can try that, they just did it. Okay, so at this point in the podcast episode, you might be thinking, well, that's awesome, Daniel, but I like making maps. I really don't want to learn the book publishing business, or I'm not interested in selling t-shirts and posters online. I, I can't make board games. I have no clue about them. And you might be asking yourself, like, well, is there, is there something for me? What, what if I just want to use the skills I have, the map making skills I have? 
What if you just want to make maps? Is there a business in making maps? So I had those same questions. And I thought to myself, I wonder if I can find some good sort of map-based businesses. And so what I mean by map-based is I mean a business built around a map. And I found one. Now, I'm not going to share the name of this or the URL because it's about a very specific type of mushroom. Some might refer to this mushroom as being magical. So when I was doing research for this, I wasn't actually looking for this specific type of mushroom. I was just looking for a map that would help me find mushrooms in general. And the reason I was doing this was because I was thinking, well, surely there, there must be some parameters we can use to estimate where the mushrooms are going to be. Every year in Denmark, lots of people head off into the forest to find mushrooms. There is a whole culture around foraging for wild mushrooms. If I go to Amazon and type in foraging for mushrooms, mushroom foraging, something like that, I get like a thousand results. You can buy special mushroom foraging bags and there seems to be an endless amount of books devoted to the topic. So there is commerce happening here. Type in mushroom foraging into Google. There are so many descriptions of what to do when foraging for mushrooms. It's kind of unbelievable. Plus all the recipes that are available for making food with the mushrooms that you've foraged. If you go to YouTube, videos with hundreds of thousands of views, all devoted to finding mushrooms, foraging for mushrooms. And it seemed kind of amazing to me that there was all this content around what to do when looking for mushrooms, how to look for mushrooms. But you know what was missing? A map. Where are the mushrooms? So think about it like this. If you were a pirate and you were on a treasure hunt and I offered you a book with the title How to Look for Buried Treasure or a map of where the buried treasure is, which one would you find most useful? So for me, it looks like there's a demand and supply problem here. There's a demand for this. Where are the mushrooms? How am I going to find the mushrooms? You know, we, we in the geospatial world, we always talk about helping people make better decisions. Well, here's a bunch of people that want to make a better decision. Where should I start looking for these mushrooms? And yet no mushroom map, except this one map for a very specific kind of mushroom. Now, I'm not going to share the, the URL. I'm not going to link to this map. You can go and find it if you want. But listen to this. When I click on the About page, this is what it says. How does it work? First, we match dates and coordinates with historical mushroom growth records with data and habitat, i.e. land cover, elevation, soil acidity, and weather, i.e. temperature, rainfall. Second, we use this data set to train a statistical model describing the conditions in which the certain kind of mushroom are more or less likely to thrive. Finally, we use this model to make live predictions a likelihood of mushroom growth across the world on any given day. And then there's a section about what data sets do we use. Here's some that you might know. So there's a land cover data set from Copernicus. This is for Europe. And there's a land cover data set for North America. And it comes from, uh, and, and the link goes to the Commission for Environmental Cooperation. This is a land, co land cover 30 meter data set from, derived from Landsat and RapidEye. We've got some soil acidity grids here. They're using an elevation data set from the satellite radar topography mission. And then there's a link to some publicly available growth records for, for this kind of mushroom. Okay, so I hope that I've done a good job of setting context here. So we've got people looking for mushrooms. We've got all of this commerce happening around mushrooms. The only thing we're missing is the, the answer to the question, where are the mushrooms? Enter this map. So this, makes, this map makes predictions about where the mushrooms are going to grow. And it's live predictions. So how is this map making money? Well, on the left-hand side, there's a button that says Get a Season Pass. So a season's pass is for one year, and I get a 10-day forecast for my six euros. I get access to the map with a satellite view, and I help keep this map running for six euros. So I really hope that you can look past the fact that all of this map is focused on a certain kind of mushroom. I hope that you can look past that. I hope that you can look at this and say, wow, here's someone who's built a business using tools that I understand, using information that I have access to. And so now you might be thinking, yeah, but it's been done, Daniel. Where is the business opportunity for me here? Where's the side hustle opportunity for me? Well, I don't see why you couldn't make this map for wild asparagus. Now, again, go to YouTube and search for how to find wild asparagus, where to find wild asparagus. Again, go to Amazon and search for foraging for food, food in the wild, that kind of thing. You'll see a plethora of books and information and equipment that you can buy to help you forage for food in the wild. I mean, what you won't see is a map about where the wild asparagus is. In fact, you probably won't see a map for enter name of edible wild plant here. Why not? Because someone like you hasn't made it yet. Just a quick side note here about wild truffles and wild ginseng. 
So firstly, let's talk about truffles. If you're wondering what a truffle is, I'm not talking about the chocolate treat kind of truffle. I'm talking about a type of fungi that is found on the roots of trees. They're a delicacy. They're used in all kinds of, of fancy recipes. And wild truffles can cost anywhere between 4000 US dollars a pound and 300 US dollars a pound. And I could not find a map that would help me make a better decision about where to look for wild truffles. So it's a similar story with ginseng. Ginseng is one of the most expensive herbs in the world. It grows in the wild. A single root can sell for up to 17,000 US dollars. And again, no map. So I, I want to change course a little bit here. So this next one is not a, a map-based business. It appears to be a business built around a map. Let me give you some context. SmokyMountains.com is the most authoritative source for restaurants, attractions, and cabin rentals in the Smoky Mountains. So this is a cabin rental company. And if you go to the website, you'll see all the normal sort of, you know, cabin rental kind of stuff. So where do you want to rent the cabin, your arrival time, your departure time, number of guests, search, all that kind of stuff. What does that have to do with maps? Well, they have a fall foliage prediction map. So, so what is this? Let me read the description of this map directly from the website. A 2021 fall foliage map is the ultimate visual planning guide to the annual progressive changing of the leaves. While no tool can be 100% accurate, this tool is meant to help travelers better time their trips to have the best opportunity to catch peak color each year. So this kind of makes sense. They've developed this tool, this map-based tool that's going to help people plan their trips. And they specialize in rental vacations. So it's sort of perfect. So what is this map? Well, it's a pretty simple looking map for a start. It's the continuous US and there's, and there's a slidey bar at the bottom. And what happens when I move the slidey bar from August 30th to September 16th? Remember, this is for 2021. The map changes. The prediction changes. So over on the legend side, we can see green is no change. We have and dark red is past peak. So again, we're talking about the, the changing of the leaf color. So we've got no change, minimal patchy, partial, near peak, peak, and past peak. So as I move the slidey bar along from September 6th to September 13th to September 20th to September 27th, you see the map change. Now this is the kind of map that people like us could make. Okay, but the promise was a business built around the map. So how is this map creating a business opportunity for SmokyMountains.com? So you need to do a bit of research to understand this. It's not immediately obvious by looking at the, the website here, just by looking at the map and moving the thing along, you say, oh, well, I mean, that's an interesting piece of content. I get that. But if we dig a little deeper, you will discover this web page has a higher authority ranking than the actual domain that's on. So that's interesting in itself. And the next thing you'll discover is that there is 31,954 website pages linking to this one page. And these links are coming from 3,321 domains. And all of those links and that domain authority that is in that one web page is driving a ridiculous amount of traffic to smokymountains.com. So again, I use a tool called Ubersuggest to sort of help me understand how much traffic is coming to this, this web page. And this tool dramatically underestimates the amount of traffic coming to mapscaping.com. So I'm assuming the same is true here, but let's stay with the figure that we get from the tool just for the sake of context. So according to the tool, this one web page is getting 52 thousand visits a month every month now again this number is probably dramatically less than what it actually is Fifty-two thousand visits every month because the good people at smokymountains.com created a tool a map-based tool that helps people make better decisions about when to plan their holidays and this is free organic traffic imagine if you had to pay for that imagine if you had to pay a dollar a click to get people to your website Fifty-two thousand dollars a month but they don't have to because they created something remarkable and people link to it and it drives a ridiculous amount of traffic to their website. And I think the interesting thing is here, you don't have to do a lot of maintenance. I mean, this will continue to be an amazing piece of content and drive a lot of traffic to your website. So that's a lot of traffic. Again, 52,000 clicks a month, every month. That's a lot of traffic for a year. But there's something else about this. Like at the time of recording this map, the 2021 fall foliage map, well, if you go into the Wayback Machine, type in the URL to this map, you will see that almost exactly the same map in 2014 was called the 2014 Fall Foliage Map. Maybe the data that they're using to base their predictions on has changed, but the map has not changed at all. This map has been driving a ridiculous amount of traffic to this website 
since 2014. My guess is that even if they paid 20, 25, 30,000 US dollars to have this map built, to have this piece of content created, that in terms of the traffic that it drives to the website, the business that it drives to this website, that this has been an absolute bargain for them. So where is the opportunity here? Well, again, people like us can make maps like this. I have to believe that there is a hiking company out there somewhere, that there is a tourism office out there somewhere that needs a map-based tool that, that predicts when the wildflowers are going to be blooming. Peak wildflower. So I, I'm not an expert on bird migration, but I'm assuming their migration is, is based on access to food. Where is the map that uses environmental variables to make estimates about the amount of food that's available and then says, hey, if you are a bird watcher and you want to see this kind of bird, here's the tool that will help you. Hey, photographer, if you want to take photos of birds, we'll help you make a better decision about where to go to do that. So I have this little app on my phone and every time I have an idea, I write it into the app. And the other day I had an idea about accountability and your job could be to sell accountability. Um, what do I mean by that? Well, if you go to Udemy, so Udemy is an online course marketplace, I guess you could call it. And if I search the, you know, let, let's take Geospatial Python, I search for Geospatial Python, I get 2,478 results for Geospatial Python. So let's assume half of those have something to do with Geospatial. Over a thousand courses with Python and Geospatial in the title. And I know from talking to a bunch of online course creators that the vast majority of people that start online courses, that they don't finish them. Now, the case, it might be the case that they got what they needed and, so, and, and then they left. But it also might be the case that what they weren't getting with their online course was accountability. No one was watching. No one cared if they finished the course or not, so they didn't. Maybe they got stuck and no one was there to help them because it was just a bunch of videos. And I look at the price of this course. So the course I'm looking at now is 18 euros, 19 euros. And the promise of the course is learn to write Python scripts for ArcGIS, QGIS, Postgres, and other geospatial software. 2,884 students have paid for this course. 358 of them have taken the time to rate and review this course. So my guess is you can't build a lot of accountability into a course like this for 18 euros. So what's the opportunity here? Well, I wonder what would happen if you took a course like this, paid your 18 euros, you already knew how to do Python or wanted to learn it yourself, learned Python, actually did the course, completed the course, and then wrote to the course creator, hey, let's work together. I've done your course, I've completed it, I've rated and reviewed it. Why don't you employ me as a tutor? Why don't we create a, a Discord server or a Facebook group? We increase the price of the course to 100 euros. Every student gets access to our private Facebook group or Discord server. And two days a week, I will be in that Discord server, in that Facebook group, helping, coaching, mentoring, tutoring students, helping them finish the course, giving them accountability. So when I went to university, this was my job. I completed a course in you know, introduction to, to GIS, for example. I completed that course, and then the next se semester, I went back and I worked as a tutor for that course. It was great. I got a chance to relearn it myself, and they needed a tutor. They needed someone to give the students accountability, to be there for them, to help th get them through the course. So I'm of the opinion that information, like how to program in Python, is a commodity. I mean, you, you can get this information any old way. And you, yeah, I, I get it that the packaging changes, the organization changes, the material changes. But let's face it, no one has a monopoly on information in and around learning Python for geospatial people. It's everywhere. There's a million different YouTube channels. There are millions of blog posts about this. There is a lot of information about this. No one has a monopoly on it. So if we think about that, if we think about information being a commodity, what isn't a commodity online? Well, I'm pretty sure accountability isn't a commodity online. And yeah, I get this won't be for everyone. You, you will price some people out of the market here, and that's okay. This doesn't have to be for everyone, but it could be for someone. It could be for that person that shows up based on the promise of you will learn to write Python scripts for ArcGIS, QGIS, Pro. Postgres and other geospatial software. They paid for that promise. They paid money based on that promise. My guess is a certain percentage of students will pay a little bit more to make sure they actually achieve that goal for that accountability, for someone watching over them and for help when they get stuck. Okay, I've got just one more idea I, I want to mention here. 
During Christmas and New Year, my family and I went on a skiing holiday. And this is the first ever skiing holiday we'd been on as a family. It was absolutely amazing. And when we were trying to find a place that would be suitable for a family like ours, so a, a bunch of beginner skiers, it would have been really helpful if we could have used something like Google Street View to check out the, the runs, to have a look at the ski field. But we couldn't because you know, there was no Google Street View for the ski field that we went to. And I started thinking about this and I thought, wow, that would be, I'm pretty sure that that would be helpful for other people. I wonder if ski fields would pay someone like us to maybe put a 360 degree camera on a drone and fly it up and down the runs and map the runs and upload it to Google Street View. I wonder if they'd pay someone like you to do something like that. I wonder if camping grounds would do the same thing. So for the past several years, we have driven from Denmark to Croatia to go camping. And I think it would be exceedingly helpful to have something like Google Street View for campgrounds. It would help you make a better decision about which camping site was right for you. And sure, there'd be some work in collecting and processing those 360 degree images, but the technology is getting better and better. I believe you can buy a, a reasonable 360 degree cam for a couple of hundred dollars. And of course, Google would host the imagery for free. So this is a kind of a half-baked idea that I have. I haven't done too much research on this. I haven't found other companies offering this as a service. I found a few platforms that will help you upload imagery to Google Street View. I found a few blog posts and articles that suggest that you can even add a logo to the imagery that you upload. And it seems to me this would be a good deal for everyone. A campground, a ski field, an outdoor recreation center will get to help people make a better decision about the facilities that they are offering. Google will host it for free. If you got someone to agree to pay for this, once the, once the project was done and finished, you could point to it and say, look, I did it over there. So you could create a very public portfolio of your work. And who knows? Maybe like every other type of imagery, maybe this imagery will need to be updated from time to time. So we've covered a lot of different topics here. And what I'm hoping that you will see is that you can use the skills that you have to create children's books, to design your own clothing brand, create wall art and sell it online, to build an email media company, or you could use your programming skills to create online map-based quizzes and games. Maybe you want to sell a subscription service to a SaaS product that helps people make better decisions about where and when to pick mushrooms or to find wildflowers. Perhaps you want to create map-based content that drives millions of views to a website that you ultimately build a business around. Or maybe you want to help people learn online. So online learning is not going away. Maybe you can build on top of what's already working. Or you might want to do none of these things. And it might just be comforting to know that you have options. That you are not stuck. I don't know what you know. I don't see what you see. And I'm not going where you are trying to go. In fact, no one is. So this means that you look at the world in a completely unique way. You will see things that nobody else will see. You will see opportunities that no one else will ever discover. And I am sure that you can come up with a million better ideas than what I've mentioned here in this podcast episode. But once you have an idea, you're going to run into a few problems. And one of them is going to be, there is no roadmap. It's going to be really difficult to find someone who's done exactly the thing that you are trying to do. It's going to be really difficult to find a recipe that you can just follow. So you're going to have to make it up yourself. You're going to have to believe in yourself. You're going to have to give yourself permission to try and fail and try and fail and try again. And it's going to be really, really difficult. But I hope you do it anyway. Another thing that you're going to discover is that if you build it, they will not come. And it's one thing to build a product, to build a service, to create something. It is a whole different thing to market that thing, to believe in it enough that you are willing to go out into the world and say, look, I made this. I saw that this was broken and I'm trying to fix it. And not everyone is going to care. But that's okay. You don't need everyone. You just need someone to care. But people can't care about it if they don't know that it exists. So marketing is hard. Marketing is really, really hard. But there's an alternative. There's another way. You don't have to do it all yourself. The alternative is to make something that is so good that people will talk about it. If you can make something that is so good that people care enough about your work to talk about it with other people, then they will do the marketing for you. But this is much easier said than done. And I think in order to do this, I think you have to be very specific about who the thing is for and what is it for. If you think about this podcast, for example, sometimes I wonder if I've made a mistake by being too broad. 
So the tagline of this podcast is, of course, a podcast for the geospatial community. Now that I've been doing this for three years, I wonder if I've, I've done myself a disservice. I wonder if I should have been more specific. I wonder if I should have made a geospatial Python podcast. A podcast specifically for geospatial data scientists. Maybe I should have. Or maybe that's an opportunity for you. And that's it for this episode of the Mapscaping Podcast. Thanks very much for tuning in. I'll see you again next week. Bye.